if you want to be successful, right? It is very, very important that you're ethical. And it is very natural to fall into that sort of mentality over here. Uh, that if there is a rat race, I need to get things done. Otherwise, I'm in trouble. Please do not fall into that trap. The 20th century computing has delivered tremendous scientific outcomes for us. We have gone to the moon. We have built space shuttles. We have uh, uh, designed highways and cars and materials without using chat GPT, right? So I think so in the future, there has to be a more uh, sort of organic coexistence of classical methods, right? There is no surrogate to being trained in classical things like approximation theory, classical things like computation statistics, PDEs, ODEs, you can't forget these things, right? You can't forget, uh, you, you should go through the process of learning how to code, learning how to debug, understanding software, hardware, all these things, uh, understanding basic mathematics, because uh, at the end of the day, the, these are these are the workhorses of our civilization today. Right? Is doing research even with undergrads? It's possible, yes. But in general, uh, undergraduate uh, engineers are doing entry-level work, which is not going to give them a lot of research experience. Perhaps those jobs are not the best for what you want to do with you know, innovation. In Python, which uh, which also scales on 100 GPUs, you just have to write 20 lines of code. Maybe 100, let's say, worst case, right? I call this phenomenon the democratization of compute. Nowadays, uh, uh, grad students within with just a course with one sort of half a year of training are, are able to write codes that can consume compute like never before in history sorry if <laughs> if it's allowed or not i don't know maybe this will have to be edited out hello students hope you all are in high spirits you should be because we are incredibly fortunate to live in a time where we have artificial intelligence which is one of the greatest blessings for humanity. If you look closely enough, you will notice that artificial intelligence or AI is involved in almost everything around us, even in small ways. For example, this is the summer time, right? And the temperature is so high. Did you know that AI can analyze weather data, understand risks and help people in charge of uh, making decisions to reduce the effects of climate change and create strong infrastructure. Not only that, in the field of environmental science and uh, remote sensing, AI technology plays a crucial role. Even when there is a limited amount of data, it has become an indispensable tool for scientists working in those areas. Additionally, AI is making a significant contributions to energy conservation efforts. As we all know that uh, energy conservation has always been a challenging task. But with the help of AI, new solutions are emerging. For example, one such solution is the concept of renewable energy. AI is aiding in the development and implementation of renewable energy sources which have the potential to address the energy challenges worlds are facing today. AI can also recognize and predict extreme weather events like hurricanes, tornadoes, heat waves and even earthquakes. Now you might be wondering that uh, how these algorithms work, how this algorithm can find patterns and connections that uh, human forecasters might miss which leads to more accurate weather prediction. Isn't it exciting? By now I guess many of you have already started imagining that how you can contribute to this incredible journey of AI. Yes? Or if you are uh, someone who loves science, theoretical science and wants to contribute the development of new scientific theories, don't be upset. I also have something exciting news for you. Theoretical scientists have always been fascinated by approximation theory, you know? Even basic concepts like integral calculus, differential calculus are actually approximations algorithm only. But it doesn't stop here. In the future, you might learn about advanced method. I think many of you are also aware about this, like finite element method, finite difference method, finite volume method. These are highly sophisticated algorithms used in various industries, such as the automobile industry where mechanical engineer and designers 
heavily rely on them. Now you know what? Here also AI comes into the picture. AI can also serve as an approximator, you know? And this raises the important question. It's a million dollar question. Could AI eventually merge all these advanced tools and outperform them to create its own dominant role? It's an interesting topic to ponder on. So why I am sharing this with you because we have a special guest with us who will shed light to many of these queries and will also provide valuable insights into building a successful career in either of these fields. Trust me or not, our discussion was uh, so engaging and exciting that even Plato, Galileo and Gauss remain captivated and joined us as listeners. Well, I'm not joking, I'm serious. I'm quite serious. So, without any further delay, let us begin our today's session. Thank you for joining us today. As I see that uh, you graduated from yes, right. BIT Mesra and uh, now, within a decade, you are working as an assistant professor at Penn State University. So, if you could share about your journey with us. Yeah, I mean, uh, firstly, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, the opportunity to speak. Uh, so, uh, my journey is, is one that is uh, it's interesting because I have a, had a lot of good luck, a lot of uh, great collaborators. They've really trained me well and then continue to assist me going forward. So... I can give you the brief recap of, of kind of what I did. So I graduated my uh, my undergrad in 2012 in mechanical engineering. I worked for one year in industry, in, uh, which, which uh, wasn't really to my liking. So I quit in, in about six, six or eight months. Uh, then I started a master's program in uh, computational biomechanics, computational and experimental biomechanics at Oklahoma State. That was a two-year program finishing in 2015. I took a six-month break after the summer of 2015 to just de-stress, went back to India, relaxed with family and friends, and then started my PhD in 2016 in, the, in January in computation fluid dynamics. And then I graduated my PhD in 2019 in January, so a three-year period, and then I started at Argonne National Laboratory uh, for uh, firstly a pre-doctoral position. A pre-doctoral position is a position where you're still to get your PhD, but you are about to get it, so so you still start work before you get your degree. Then transition to a postdoctoral fellowship for two years. Uh, that was 2021. At the end of my postdoctoral fellowship, I was promoted to a staff scientist at Argonne National Laboratory, and I uh, and I will be uh, and I spent two years as a staff scientist uh, before starting uh, an assistant professorship at Penn State in the information science department. Uh, the staff scientist position still continues. So here uh, in the U.S., we have the advantage of having joint positions between uh, academia and, uh, say, another institution. So I will be uh, continuing my Argonne affiliation, but my primary appointment will be Penn State University. So I will run a research group that has students both at Penn State, uh, students and postdocs both at Penn State as well as at Argonne. So Okay, nice to hear that. So, uh, starting with, uh, do you think that uh, it is helpful to have experience in the industry before joining as a full-time researcher? Because as you know that, uh, I mean, the demands are different in the sense, say, in, in case of research, it, it requires a lot of patience and dedications. And sometimes you may have to spend uh, a sufficient amount of time on a single problem, while uh, in case of industry, you have some deadlines to finish the specific projects. So what, I mean, what are your thoughts on this matter? Uh, it's a good question. So uh, I, I think it's, so I, I did have some industry research, right? I had about a year of industries uh, experience, sorry. Um, and uh, I think it's a good idea to try it because uh, at the very least, you will know what you are giving up. Right. I mean, I think it will give you some perspective on how things work in industry. Of course, I had an entry level job after my bachelor's and uh, I, I decided I did not like it at all. So I, and I went into research and I much prefer the research lifestyle, which is thinking about a problem deeply, having the luxury to sort of chase a greater slice of 
perfection rather than you know as you mentioned uh, hitting a deadline but that being said there are many industrial positions which give you this type of uh, freedom you know there are many uh, uh, many companies uh, at least in in the us i can talk about companies uh, on the bay you uh, know in, in the bay area in tech uh, where there are these research positions which uh, which are very very they they are probably on the bleeding edge of science and technology you know uh, just like say uh, you know a research group in a big school so as so i would say it really depends from position to position uh, that being said if you're interested in doing research uh, i think you have to go and get post graduate education you need to go and get a masters or a phd and in that sense maybe an entry level experience is not going to be super helpful right uh, this is i'm just giving the expectation i'm not giving you like individual examples right you can obviously start a, a join a startup company which is doing research even with undergrads it's possible yes but in general uh, undergraduate uh, engineers are doing entry level work which is not going to give them a lot of research experience perhaps those jobs are not the best for what you want to do with you know innovation so i guess uh, there is no straight answer to this uh, i think uh, it's always good to communicate clearly with anyone who wants to hire you right uh, about about your expectations uh, i was happy that i tried it because i know now that i don't want to go back okay so can you share any interesting projects or collaborations you have been involved in recently or any ongoing research you find particularly exciting okay you are asking me to choose between my children <laughs> I, i like all my all my projects i like all my collaborations uh, i want to keep increasing my projects and collaborations it's very difficult for me to answer this question um but i can i can share i guess a couple of things that are really interesting at the moment so as you know there is a big push in the us for so called climate action uh people understand that climate change is 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 really here and it's uh, something that has to be understood better something that has to be uh modeled better and its effects have to be uh, described better on populations uh, on infrastructure and so uh, one of the things that i'm really interested in is building data science based or machine learning based models for basically forecasting things like extreme events in the weather or trying to build more stable more accurate models for forecasting the effects of you know human sort of forcings on on the climate so you know carbon dioxide emissions and so on and so for this we are actually working with uh, scientists in the department of energy across various national labs we're also working with uh, microsoft on this to build uh, you know deep learning models that can uh for example uh help us determine that an extreme weather event might happen right an extreme heat event or an extreme precipitation event so of course this is a very difficult project but that's what's fun about it we are working on it uh, for quite a while and uh, and honestly even though i have a background in aerospace engineering i've worked extensively with fluid dynamical systems in the past so there's a lot of interesting problems that are common to both uh, both engineering and and climate science so it helps me kind of uh, solve problems in multiple communities at once right so that's also another interesting thing i just have one additional question with this that uh, what is your perspective on uh, i mean how you see the intersection of uh, scientific machine learning and high performance computing shaping the futures of research and discovery uh, i think uh, it's already it's already starting to shape research and discovery i mean uh, the, these algorithms they're here to stay right and uh, you cannot argue against some of the results that they are getting i think the easiest way to explain this is to just consider a, a graduate student getting a phd 20 years ago versus a graduate student getting a phd now right so 20 years ago if you had to write a code that could scale on 100 cores 100 cpus uh, you would have to take 3 years to write this code in fortran or c or c++ and it would be uh, almost half if not 60% of your thesis now if you want to write a, a code that in python which uh, which also scales on 100 gpus you just have to write 20 lines of code maybe 100 let's say worst case right i call this phenomena the democratization of compute nowadays uh, uh grad students within with just a course with one sort of half a year of training are are able to write codes that can consume compute like never before in history right 
and you have to adapt to that right we have to train students to 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 use these methods we have to to solve research questions using these methods right so there is no point in saying that oh in the future we have to ignore them because these are all a hoax no uh, there are there is of course a lot of literature being generated not all of it is going to end up being uh, super useful but uh, I, I still believe that at the very least, ML and HPC, just the raw power they bring to the average user because of the ecosystem we have, right? The amount of GPUs that are available to us nowadays. You can go on Colab on Google and get uh, get a GPU for, for I don't know how many hours a month, which which is just do the, do the math on how many floating point operations become available to you just by calling Colab for free. It was not the case with a regular computation right in the past. So I believe that, uh, you know, research questions aside, we are we are definitely in in a new sort of uh, paradigm for scientific computing, right? Where, where GPUs, where data, uh, it has to be considered at the inception of the project, not, not as an afterthought. Can you share some of the most exciting applications or breakthroughs you have seen in the field of computational fluid dynamics? Sure, I, I can uh, I can give you a slightly broader answer. I mean, more, not just fluid dynamics, but in general dynamical systems, which of course fluid dynamics is a dynamical system. Uh, uh, I can talk about some of the research that I'm aware of in my field. So uh, recently there has been a bunch of papers published by collaborations between national labs in the US, academics, as well as the Bay Area companies on forecasting the weather. Uh, which which is also a computation fluid dynamics problem, right? And and, and in this uh, there are some papers. Uh, for example, there is a paper called GraphCast by Google. Uh, you know, feel free to reach out if you if you want the exact links of these papers. The it's a graph neural network that forecasts the weather uh, as accurately as a numerical code, uh, as accurately as a state of the art weather forecast uh, that you see on your phone. Uh, there is another paper by NVIDIA called ForecastNet, which uses a, a novel uh, machine learning al al algorithm called the Fourier Neural Operator. And uh, uh, and there is uh, and in China there are a couple of uh, couple of uh, algorithms called uh, well I know one which is called the Pangu Weather Algorithm, which uses transformers to to uh, forecast the weather and all these are very exciting because they're actually giving you weather forecasts for the entire planet on your laptop or on your mobile phone comparison with running it on a large uh, data center so so this is very exciting uh, uh, there are definitely you know opportunities to improve these methods of course because right now they are just making forecasts to minimize, you know, like how you train machine learning algorithms, you minimize a mean squared error, right? But mean squared error does not mean your physics is satisfied. So there are opportunities to improve these algorithms to make them more physically realistic before we actually start using them instead of high performance computing methods. But and my cat also is interested in this. Sorry if <laughs> if it's allowed or not. I don't know. Maybe this will have to be edited out. But I have three cats, so they are my collaborators so so these are some some i think breakthroughs that are that are quite interesting at the moment uh, in addition to this there is also a lot of interest in reinforcement learning for controlling dynamical systems uh, so recently there was a paper from uh, i think it was uh, some people in google where they uh, controlled the simulation of a, a tokamak reactor so a plasma uh, a plasma physics simulation for fusion and they were able to get uh, more efficient containment of, of plasma in a nuclear fusion device so so we are interested in these types of things as well so there's a lot of a lot of interesting things happening out there right uh, so and and i think uh, since you mentioned applications and breakthroughs these are these are some of the main things but in addition to that people are continuously trying to uh, investigate new uh, algorithms uh, for surrogate modeling, for for solving PDs more efficiently. There are uh, you know like operator learning ideas, physics informed machine learning ideas, which are which are quite exciting. There are some problems that that need to be solved be before we can use these in place of finite difference, finite volume, or finite element methods. Uh, but there is a niche that they have carved out for themselves where they can be used at least in combination. I don't think we are there yet in terms of replacing existing numerical methods. In addition to this, you know, these machine learning methods are extremely good at learning representations. So they're very good for compressing data. So from a logistics point of view, let's say you're running a big simulation and you, you're running it the traditional way, 
uh, if you want to explore the data, visualize it more uh, quickly. If you want to, for example, make it more fault tolerant, right? So that if one part of your simulation crashes, it keeps running. The machine learning has been very useful over there as well. Just representing data very efficiently, very accurately, uh, using less computational resources than previously. So this is something also that that I'm quite interested in. And uh, so dimensionality reduction, basically. Thanks for such a nice answer. So how do you envision the future of uh, computational sciences and uh, what advancements do you hope to see in the coming years? Uh, future of computational science is a very, very broad term, right? I think uh, computational sciences are uh, are here to stay. They're getting, I guess, democratized. I think this is a word I used previously. Um, previously, uh, whenever anyone had to do a simulation or to or to kind of uh, use computation in their product design it was very budget constrained right and so now uh, we are in a uh, in an era where uh, both the compute and the ability to use that compute so if you have resources how do you efficiently use the resources these are things that are getting more and more easier to master right I'll go back to that example. 20 years ago, if you had to write a school, uh, code that scaled, you would need to know MPI in C, or you would need to know something like PET-C or, uh, or LAPAC or BLAST. These are all now available to you without you even knowing it, right? These are all kind of abstracted away in modern sort of programming languages. So, so I think uh, the future of computation sciences is that it's more and more uh, broadly uh, broadly uh, sort of utilizable, right? So it's more broadly kind of available to the ordinary person, right? Uh, and, uh, and and in this uh, scenario, uh, I believe that multiple algorithms are also broadly applicable to people. We've talked about machine learning, but classical scientific computing, you know, where you are discretizing your governing laws and, and solving them or doing Monte Carlo or molecular dynamics, you know, these are things that I don't think should be forgotten. I don't think they will be forgotten because at the end of the day, they have delivered results over the last uh, several decades. I just think that they will be more broadly applicable, right? Uh, when I was an undergrad student, I had no idea about, uh, I don't know, sampling a density, right? But I see students uh, sending me applications for PhDs now uh, who are able to do Monte Carlo simulations uh, on their desktop because desktops are also more powerful than previously, right? So this is, it's inevitable, right? So the future of computation sciences is one of uh, equity, is one of inclusion, uh, and, and is one of innovation coming from not just the big universities or the big tech giants, but also coming from uh, places that you're not looking, uh, paying much attention to, right? So it could come from an undergraduate student or a high school student. So I think that is what is the most exciting thing about the future of computation sciences. So I encourage, you know, people who are, listening to us speak over here, that if you are interested in computational sciences, do not think that there is a lack of infrastructure or educational material that prevents you from uh, from innovating, right? There's all this material that is out there uh, on the internet. Uh, there's compute also out there on the internet. Uh, we talked about Colab. Go out there and, and just start doing crazy things, right? I think that's, that's the biggest advantage you have over, say, I did 10 years ago, right? Uh, and in terms of advancements, I think... Uh, you know, some of the things that I'm more interested in are is a better sort of integration between, say, 20th century computing and 21st century computing. So if you think about 21st century computing, it's all chat GPT and it's all machine learning and neural networks. And, you know, it's all very exciting, very sexy research, right? There's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, sort of following that direction. But the 20th century computing has delivered tremendous scientific outcomes for us. We have gone to the moon, we have built space shuttles, we have uh, uh, designed highways and cars and materials without using chat GPT, right? So I think uh, what I would be really interested in is uh, it's not forgetting those things, right? So in the future, there has to be a more uh, sort of organic coexistence of classical methods, right? There is no surrogate to being trained in classical things like approximation theory, classical things like computation statistics, PDEs, ODEs, you can't forget these things, right? You can't forget, uh, you, you should go through the process of learning how to code, learning how to debug, understanding software, hardware, all these things, uh, understanding basic mathematics, because uh, at the end of the day, the, these are 
these are the workhorses of our civilization today, right? Uh, Chat GPT or, or these sort of modern things are great tools. They are great inventions, right? They were they are disruptive for sure, but nothing can replace true scientific understanding of a problem. Nothing can uh, replace true competence with scientific computing, right? Nothing can replace the the pen and paper. So so just make sure that uh, in the future, I wish to make sure that my students, my research program, my collaborators also if they want to listen to me. <laughs> uh, I, I, I want them to, to make sure that uh, there is an elegant sort of combination of the modern data science-centric scientific computing, whereas the classical, say, PD, OD, numerical analysis-based scientific computing. Could you please uh, provide some insights into your research area? And uh, with this, I have one additional question linked into it that uh, what are the current uh, project opportunities available within your group to be more specific uh, what are some key factors that would be ideal for joining your group uh, sure so i i have several project uh, projects going on at the moment uh, uh, i'm happy to uh, go into the details of each project i will try to keep the technical details as low as possible but uh, my website has more information on all these things right so broadly speaking i i work in you know at the intersection of high performance computing scientific computing and data science right and in terms of projects i have projects from various domains so for example in the aerospace engineering domain i'm working on building better basically modeling strategies using data limited settings so to give you an example of course if you have a lot of data there are a lot of these machine learning methods that work really nicely for you right if you have a lot of data but what happens if you don't have a lot of data right uh, and in but instead you have some equations so how do you use equations in a data limited scenario to build better models so it's a classic inverse problem strategy so to give you an example let's say you're working on something like hypersonic reentry just to give you a cool example. So when uh, NASA sends its rovers to Mars, each rover generates one time series of data, essentially, with a few sensors on top of its, uh, of its entry capsule. Of course, you can run CFD simulations of this entry capsule in Martian atmospheres, but it's not very accurate because we don't know what the Martian atmosphere is exactly like at the point of entry. So using these imperfect CFD simulations, uh, these imperfect fluid simulations and imperfect sources of data, not imperfect, very small sources of data. How do you get a better outcome so that your uh, lander can reach safely, right? So this is, for example, one project I'm very interested in. Uh, and, I'm, and, and, and I'm going to work on this with a student in the fall. A similar sort of project also also exists for weather, right? So so you can you can simulate the weather on on PDs using PDs on HPCs. You can even use these machine learning techniques that are coming out there. But in real time, the weather is very different from what you simulated, right? In real time, uh, to get uh, information from the weather, you need weather stations, you need satellite data, you need drones, right? And so these varying different streams of information can be combined into your forecast model to get better uh, predictions, right? So this is these are what we call inverse problems. You have lots of uh, compute, but you have very little data, right? It's still a machine learning problem, but it's not your typical machine learning problem where you have a lot of data and you just fit a model, right? So it requires something called a structure preserving machine learning paradigm. So so these are some things that, that I'm interested in working on at the moment. Other things that are interesting to me are symbolic regression. So, you know, everybody can fit neural networks, right? They are easy. They are easy to deploy. But frequently, the requirement for any user of your machine learning is that they understand what is going on, right? So they understand the law that you've discovered. In such cases, the idea is to use things like symbolic regression, which uh, instead of fitting a neural network, they'll fit expressions, right, for you. So you given data, it gives you expressions. Then you can, as a physicist or a chemist or a or a scientist, you look at the expression and you and you understand. Okay, this is what my data is actually telling me, right? So so fitting data uh, to to expressions rather than machine rather than black box algorithms, right? I'm also interested in uh, using machine learning for social science. So we collaborate to try to use data to understand and diagnose human behavior. So for example, we collect data from questions uh, asked to people in say certain zip codes, 
and and then we um, we see whether they support a particular policy or not for example right and we try to understand okay if the goal for the government is for them to support a particular policy for example the government wants people to be more prepared right prepared for a tornado prepared for a flood and we try to understand using this data collection what types of people do not want to prepare for a flood right and then we try to understand can we get them to prepare for a flood right so uh, so these types of things are are also you know machine learning interpretable machine learning methods are actually quite useful for that because it tells you that a certain age group or a certain uh, income group these are the people who are uh, for example not willing to or unable to may they may be willing but they're not able to to kind of take a certain action and then the then you as a government you can go in and make more targeted sort of deployment of resources deployment of education to to help these things right i i i think the second part of your question was what would you like to see in a resume right for from someone wishing to approach me yeah firstly i have an open mind i keep an open mind when i when i look at people's emails and their resumes uh, oh, i'm just looking for curiosity right I, i think resumes which show people are trying something different is always a good thing now what different is it depends on person to person right if you're doing a if you're doing an electrical engineering major but then you done a project on pds let's say which is not typically something an electrical major does right that's something that i would like look at it and look at it as a positive i'm like okay this guy is because that's something i did as well right when i was in my grad school i uh, actually i actually had an agreement with my advisor that i would not take any aerospace engineering courses I told him that uh, listen I can learn aerospace from textbooks I have the training uh, but let me go and take courses in computer science in statistics in other things right so so I think someone who has who has shown some curiosity beyond what was always available to them that is always good right whether it shows up in your course projects or shows up in research experience right that is always good um, but to make things a little more tangible I do uh, expect people to know how to code before they join my group right so and i think it's because if you have to learn to code while you start doing a research you're too far behind right uh, so in my opinion uh, and it's bad uh, for the student as well to to kind of waste a certain amount of time in their phd just learning how to code right so so if you have experience of programming link links to your github where i can see that you have done projects you have your commit history is there right so i can see that you are actually adding lines and you're adding I think this is a very strong positive. I think the rest you can you can pick up, but programming is something that is yeah that is uh, unfortunately uh, the most important thing. The ability to code, the ability to to debug, the ability to look at different uh, you know like libraries online, look at different papers online, and then reproduce them uh, without much overhead. That is, I think. Uh, indispensable to a group so all the people who work with me they are phenomenal coders yeah we all write several several lines of code a day and and if you have evidence of this in your in your resume in your github i think that would be most most beneficial right so uh, yeah thank you for such a nice explanations and insights so we are on the verge of our ending of our discussion so i just have one final question that uh, what advice would you give to aspiring researchers or students interested in pursuing a career in computational sciences and in data sciences so i think the most important thing is is curiosity i think you need to you need to be curious uh, and you also need you need to throw off sort of this heavy burden of being afraid okay this is something i've uh, suffered from when i read a paper say from a rival research group or uh, just the papers my advisor gave me at the start of my phd or my ms i looked at it and i thought oh my god i'm dumb i can't understand anything i think i and you must have felt the same occasionally when you read some papers at the start of your your education but you you need to cherish that feeling you shouldn't be afraid of it you need to cherish it that is when you're learning something right if you look at a paper and you get everything immediately and then you have not learned anything new right it, so curiosity has to go with i guess the right word is is bravery right you need to look at situations that make you feel stupid and actually value them because that's when there is a lot to gain right so so i think when when you have difficult papers when you have difficult codes when you have difficult concepts try to put yourself in those situations okay so that is i think as a philosophical bit of advice to you right uh, is to kind of never back down 
right from a tough problem right and uh, and then uh, in addition i guess uh, uh, this is again a more specific piece of advice which which has helped me a lot i, I like to have email alerts of different uh, topics which interest me and i set them up in my inbox so every morning i get an update of the new papers that have come out in a particular field right and uh, that really helps me in my literature review right this is maybe after you've sort of had a basic introduction to a field you have read some of the more foundational papers and now you're trying to do research right so you said researchers so when when you're ready to do research it's always good to know what your competition is doing right and and the, and every morning you see uh, what is the newest paper newest idea what is generating headlines i think you are one step ahead of the competition right just just because you got it right as it was put on the internet and google scholar is a great scraping tool right it really scrapes things very well but in the but also another you know very important thing is you know uh, if you want to be successful right it is very very important that you're ethical right now this is also another piece of advice i'm giving that is maybe not directly tangibly related to success in the metric of a job or or money or something Uh, nothing hurts humanity more than you faking data or claiming something is original when it's not right and the reason i say this is because we have grown up in a rat race we have computed since the day we are born and it is very natural to fall into that sort of mentality over here uh, that if there is a rat race i need to get things done otherwise i'm in trouble please do not fall into that trap right you are hurting not just yourself of course but you're hurting the whole of humanity as the researchers if you if you do something like that right the us values honesty the us values hard work so be honest work hard even if things don't fall the way that you want them to do not give up on these basic principles of 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 being ethical being so uh, if you do that things will fall in place right so i i'm okay if if a student comes to me even when the paper is completely written and says oh i made a mistake this graph should not be as nice as it looks i think i will feel very proud as a mentor if that is the case that the student is willing to you know it is 8 months of work or 6 months of work because they still believe that you know it's not right to publish something like that and i will never be upset at someone even though they made the mistake because of which the graph looks bad so i think you should you should always uh, follow that uh, that and this is not just for computational data science people this is for in general right uh, and, and and generally we we kind of uh, we i appreciate for sure and many of my colleagues appreciate people who are uh, who are transparent about their research right so the world is going in that direction yeah okay thank you for such a helpful and engaging conversation mm. so yeah we wish you all the best for your future sure. interviews Thank you. Thank you.